Welcome to this edition of Security and Compliance Weekly. On our show today, we welcome back Liam Downward, who's the CEO of Cyrisma, also our, t- our sponsor for today. You may recall we spoke to Liam, uh, I think it was episode 45, so just a you know, month or so ago, uh, talking about a data-centric approach to security. And if you uh, believe it, we're going to keep talking about data, data, data on today's show. And I don't even think Star Trek is going to come up. Uh, anyway, the whole show is dedicated to this discussion because we enjoy talking to Liam so much. So join us as we continue to tear down silos and build bridges on Security and Compliance Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production. And now, it's the show that bridges the requirements of regulations, compliance, and privacy with those of security. Your trusted source for complying with various mandates, building effective programs, and current compliance news. It's time for Security and Compliance Weekly. The average cost to respond to an insider threat is $11.45 million. That's a lot of reasons why a functional insider threat program must be a core part of any modern cybersecurity strategy. To protect your organization's sensitive data and meet compliance requirements, you need controls in place to deter, detect, and disrupt insider threats. With ECRAN system, you can meet control requirements imposed by compliance mandates all within one insider threat management platform. Get your free 30-day trial at securityweekly.com forward slash ECRAN. That's E-K-R-A-N, and fulfill your compliance requirements. It's the end of the quarter. You've got a mountain of compliance tasks to complete, daily requests from sales for security documentation, and an upcoming audit. You're waiting on evidence requests, and you can't find the policy you wrote last week. Compliance management is hard. Aptable Comply makes it simple. Comply is an end-to-end, purpose-built GRC platform to manage compliance. From automating evidence collection to integrating with your existing SaaS tools, Comply simplifies the hardest parts of managing compliance. Reduce manual processes and build trust with your customers. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Aptable to learn more. Cyber risk and compliance automation is finally here. Legacy GRC systems cannot simplify the complex use cases and deliver powerful automation that cyber teams need. CyberSaint's integrated risk management solution ingests data from your existing tech stack, dynamically lighting up controls using patented AI. Leverage your expertise and showcase business value. Let your risk and compliance solution work for you. See why the most forward-thinking CISOs of the Fortune 500 support their teams with CyberSaint. Maximize your cybersecurity program today, visit securityweekly.com forward slash cybersaint SCW. And welcome to episode number 51 of Security and Compliance Weekly, recorded on November 10th, 2020. I'm your host, Mr. Jeff Mann, and joining me today are my illustrious co-hosts, Mr. Josh Marpet, Mr. Scott Lyon, and Mr. John Snyder, Esquire. Welcome, gentlemen. Pleasure. We are ready for you, Mr. Man. We are ready. Ooh, the, the, you're going to try to bait me into saying a certain word. I can tell it already. What, what were <laughs> oh, you yes. talking about? Uh, uh, we'll get to that. Uh, I have a couple <laughs> announcements to, to start off the show. First, uh, November 10th, 2020. It's the 245th birthday of the U.S. Marine Corps. So happy birthday, all you devil dogs out there. Thank you for your service. And, and, and thank you for... Uh, keeping our country afloat, uh, at least for the time being. Uh, Also, uh, Security Weekly, in partnership with Cyber Risk Alliance, is excited to present Security Weekly Unlocked, which will be on December 10th, 2020. That's just a month away. This one-day virtual event wraps up with the 15th anniversary edition of Paul's Security Weekly, live on YouTube. And I feel more and more like we might all be virtual for that celebration, unfortunately. But fingers crossed, I'm hoping to get to the studio. Uh, You can learn about this by going to securityweekly.com forward slash unlocked, view the agenda, and of course, register for free. Also, in our upcoming webcasts and technical trainings, you will learn why you should stop trying to discover and classify data. Hmm. 
Might want to comment on that today, Liam. Uh, mm -hmm. How to thwart attackers using deception and how to build a risk-based vulnerability management program. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash webcast to see what we have coming up. And, of course, visit securityweekly.com forward slash on demand to, to view our previously recorded webcasts. All righty. Today, we are excited to welcome back Liam Downward to the show. Welcome, Liam. Good to see welcome, you again. Man. Hey everybody! Good to I'm, see I'm, good to see the disembodied head version of you. I Dude, know it's I totally gray, want that the gray background. <laughs> no, the, I want that blue steel right. look. There it is. There it is. Yes. Oh God! <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> hey, you know what? You got to have fun, guys. You know, really. You know, we talk about a the certain item that Jeff likes to talk data. about. Yep. So uh, um, I'm up today. I'm sure. What me? It'll come up I, today. I'm sure. Oh, yeah, absolutely will. I will. Oh, but I got a question for you guys. I want to kind of start off and I want to jump right into it. And I want to ask a question. What does data mean to everybody here, right? We're all from different spectrums of, of information security and cybersecurity. What exactly does data mean uh, to you guys? Um, because for me, I like to hear what other people's opinions are around data so we can kind of actually have a good discussion about it, whether that's through process or through technology. So it kind of feels like I'm interviewing you guys today. It does oh, feel that man. way. Who do you want to who do you want to respond first? I'll I will start off with uh, anybody that feels that they have a thought come to their head right now, Josh. Okay, repeat the question because I missed a, a, a <laughs> word in there. <laughs> All right. So, what does data mean to you? Right. There's two parts. Ah, of it. You know, what does it okay. mean to you? Because we have we have process and we have technology. Right. So, what does it actually mean? You know, that's a really good question. Data is a, uh, I mean, there's a truism, which is data is the new oil, okay? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that it, it's it's true and it's cliched all at the same time. Uh, and uh, what it is, is it, it's the fuel that all of our business runs on. Data yeah. is what we use to build our processes. We use it to classify our, our, our systems uh, along with the data itself, data classification. Uh, data is the fuel for business in today's modern age. I mean, if, if you want to boil it down to the, the, the nitty gritty, it's what fuels everything right now. Uh, I mean, I can expand on that extensively, but I, th I think that's really a good spot to start. Now, before yeah. before I let go, give me one second here. Uh, I wanted to add one quick announcement, uh, and I apologize, I'm sort of stealing the stage. I forgot to talk to you, Jeff, about this, but it's really quick. Uh, Besides Delaware is this Friday. That's my conference. So uh, if anybody would like to go, it's a virtual conference, uh, besidesdelaware.com, B-S-I-D-E-S, -E Delaware, spell out the state, dot com. And it's uh, free or five bucks if you feel like donating to register. Uh, we're doing a Discord conference. We've got talks and we're going to have a good time on Wireless Village and lots of other things going on. You're, you're so, forgiven, Josh, and I like how you spell out B-sides, but assume people know how to spell Delaware. <laughs> if you don't know how to spell Delaware, you need to go back to... Eighth grade geography class? <laughs> Just saying. Uh, okay, fortunately, so there's a link in the Discord channel, so whew, we're all saved. Saved by Andrea. Thank you, Andrea. All right, so, as, uh, as, as, I'm, as long as I'm talking, I'll, I'll throw yeah. out an answer yeah. as well. Um, uh, and I appreciate you asking a, a, a question that actually, do, let, you know, start. let's start off by defining our terminology. Love that. Yeah. Um, not enough of that in this world. Uh, it, it's interesting because uh, when I started in this business, I, I, I didn't even work in, in an organization that was called information security. It was called communications security or ComSec for the uh, DOD military minded. And it was all about the transmission the, uh, of, of data, uh, of, uh, of communications type of data. Uh, I learned the classic data triad, uh, the three prongs of the stool, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And, uh, you know, when I got first started getting into hacking at NSA, I think one of my early motivations uh, was the movie Sneakers, where there's the famous quote within that movie, uh, you know, we're, we're f and I'm going to paraphrase it, I should have it memorized and I don't, but, you know, we're in the middle of a war and the war's not being fought with bullets, it's being fought online and it's all about the information, it's all about the data. Um, so data to me is is information, data is, is all the stuff that's 
being translated into ones and zeros that are being processed and transmitted over all the technology that we love to uh, break into and, and try to protect. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's not the systems, it's the information that's on the system. So I guess data to me is information and it's the, it's, it's classically, it's the stuff that makes your company run. It's the stuff that you care about. It's the stuff that we are trying to protect from a confidentiality, integrity and availability standpoint mm -hmm. with a few variations. Now that we are in a technological age, which we can debate and argue whether there's more than three prongs to the stool these days when it comes to data security, I'll leave mm -hmm. it at that. Oh, and you know, you know PC, go ahead, Jim. and PCI. I'll just get that. Oh, out. you had to do it, oh, didn't you? Oh, 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 oh. You, we are on you the board, had, ladies and gentlemen. You we are had on the board. To do it. You had to do it, <laughs> man. Uh, Jeff, you know, you know, right before you said PCI, I was totally going to break in and be like, "You're being so meta, right?" Uh, you see right. what I did there? Meta data, um, data about the data, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> I had to go there with that. Um, being able to uh, understand, track, and discern uh, where the data came from and then go back to the source and see if there's a leak if you're doing PCI or if your data is out of bounds from a compliance standard, mm -hmm. right? Um, data, unfortunately, is also uh, in the digital era what defines who we are. Like it's the bits and bobs and pieces of who we are, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, Google, Apple, the the Facebook, right? Um, yeah. They're constantly mining data, and there are uh, uh, super warehouses that know absolutely everything about every single person and what their habits are throughout the U.S. So, being able to protect that and bring that under compliance uh, and handle the data and the metadata uh, uh, is really the key to uh, most data-driven programs. Uh, I want to say one more thing because you you prodded my memory. Thank you, Scott. Um, I it, hope it's not know, PCI. <laughs> data, uh, in the traditional sense, the 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 sensitive, critical data, data that we want to protect. Um, classically, you know, what, and by classically, I mean when I was a kid, back in the uh, horse and buggy days. Uh, it was things like your your name, your address, your phone number, uh, bank account numbers, credit card numbers, which is where PCI comes in, of course. Uh, didn't even have debit cards back in those days. Um, it's funny because a lot of that information, particularly name, address, phone number, was it's not what I consider to be sensitive data because it was publicly available. Mm -hmm. um, I find it, 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 it two things interesting in, in the world that we live in today. One, that our view of what is considered uh, privacy data has somewhat changed in terms of the classic things like, you know, God forbid somebody should know where you live these days or uh, associate your, your, your mobile number with you, that type of thing. Uh, but also the fact that there's so much more data and this touches on what Scott's saying about even metadata. I think I think there's some overlap. Um, uh, there's there's new types of data that are being generated that are about us that people acknowledge and and put into the the privacy bucket, if not the critical sensitive data bucket. That's so much beyond. Uh, what we consider data to be in a, in a classical sense. Things like metadata, things like mm -hmm. uh, our GPS location, uh, yeah. our, our, our viewing habits on TV and on, mm -hmm. on uh, streaming media and on you know, our browsing habits and things like that. E even how long we stay and where did we click from and where do we click to. All this yeah. stuff that people care about that wasn't on anybody's uh, radar screen uh, several years ago. Uh, one type of data in particular, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, um, in, in the world of healthcare and the HIPAA regulations, we, we talk about uh, personal health care information, PHI, mm -hmm. and that's what HIPAA is all about, protect, protecting it. When I looked into the HIPAA regulation a few years ago, I was kind of shocked and dismayed to find that there wasn't really a definition of PHI. There was lots <laughs> of 
well, it looks like this, and if and it can be in this form, and it's associated with this. If it looks like a duck and walks like a duck, and yeah, yeah, it must yeah, be there's PCI. no actual. It must be a duck. definition. Whereas PCI says it's payment card data, it's credit yeah. and debit card numbers, yeah. and the information basically that's printed electronically or physically on a plastic card uh, for the major card brands: Visa, yeah. Mastercard, okay. Amex. So, Jeff, Discovery. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. I'm going to tell you that the problem is that with credit card data, uh, mm. can I do I know your credit card number? Absolutely. I know all of your credit card numbers. Uh, I have a list of every 16 digit number possible. I just don't know which ones are yours, unfortunately. OK, right. Right. with and that's sort of a joke and, and sort of and, not. With, and, well, and, and you don't need to know all all permutations of the 16 digits because there's a lot of limitations built into that number. That true, if you're, true. Well said. <clears throat> so I mean, but the point is, is that the, the, the important data to the whatever is sixteen to the tenth or ten to the sixteenth. I wasn't a mathematician. You know, sixteen it, to it's, the tenth. <clears throat> it's it's much 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 reduced than that. But go ahead. I agree. I'm the sorry. key space the key space is much smaller than that. But the point is, is that there's a definitive and finite key space for those numbers. Now, when you match those numbers with the the rest of the pan, the expiration date, the CVV2, it's that kind of thing, the, the, you've got to fill out a whole set of requirements to get up a number that you can actually use. So far, so good. Mm -hmm. But every so far, piece so of that, uh, every piece of that system is numeric and it's very defined. With healthcare mm -hmm. data, uh, I actually did this with uh, one of the ride sharing companies. Uh, we were actually consulted on uh, doing ride shares for medical dispatch. So not an ambulance to take somebody to a dialysis clinic. It's not an emergency thing. It's just a, they need a medical appointment type of thing. And uh, I said to them, you know, you've got some problems. They're like, why? I'm like, well, you've got to protect the data. Like, we don't know what they're going there for. I'm like, I'm sorry, but if you take Mr. Jeff Mann, I'm just going to pick on you for a second, to the dialysis clinic twice a week, I'm fairly sure he's got kidney problems. Okay, you can infer data from other data in the in the healthcare world, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so it's mm -hmm. not a definitive and finite set of data. It, is, it can be inferred, it can be extrapolated, it can be, you get the idea. So yep. in, in the same sense that classified data, and I know you've dealt with that before, uh, in, in a hypothetical sense, um, can be inferred. As a matter of fact, they came up with, uh, was it SBU, sensitive but unclassified because of that? Because they said if, if uh, Electric Boat in Norfolk gets a, uh, a submarine contract and all of a sudden Electric Boat buys a huge load of titanium, I wonder what the new submarine is made out of, right? Mm -hmm. right. Okay, so sensitive well, that, but unclassified. That's more, that's more Tom Clancy hunt for Red October and, and all the trouble he got into publishing a novel. And, if, and I'll acquaint you guys since... Our listening audience may not be familiar with the story, but back in the early 80s, an author named Tom Clancy published this book called The Hunt for Red October that was all about uh, nuclear-powered submarines, anti-submarine warfare, submarine warfare, and the detail that he had in that book about the technology involved in these nuclear sub submarines, both Soviet and American, was so spot on that the military, the Navy, decided this guy's got to be a spy. He's 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 acts, he's he's giving away all this top secret information in this book. Turns out, all he was doing, uh, you know, early OSINT, uh, I guess you could call it, was he was looking at all sorts of publicly available information and doing exactly what you just said. So just sort of putting two and two together and 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 drawing reasonable conclusions that that turned out to be spot on and of course you know the fact that they were all upset and aware of it proved to him oh i, I must be on to something i must have guessed right anyway go ahead well, well i mean you're, you're also talking about the guy that used to attend the the department of defense garage sales and eventually built out an entire you know classified weapon system and the dod <laughs> comes by because he's putting it up on like you know the equivalent of reddit and the you know, forum posts or whatever and he's putting mm -hmm. pictures he's like this is awesome it does this and the Department of Defense stops by and goes, excuse me, that's classified. He goes, hey, I bought it from you. What do you want? Well, you know? let, me, let, me, let me just ask a question here. He's like, you talk about ride sharing. We talk about, we talk about organizations that PCI. We've got healthcare. We've got all these entities. There are certain entities that actually know and understand their sensitive data. There's other entities that have access to sensitive data because them themselves 
they presume that they are not for enforced by level of compliance or a type of regulatory compliance. Therefore, any free space that they see, they fill up with data, which could either be you know, public domain data or it could be sensitive data. So like take your ride sharing uh, entity. No doubt they take Medicare and Medicaid numbers for billing because people go to dialysis, go to different places. But when you ask them, they're like, oh, we don't know anything about their health care, but you're taking sensitive information. The information they may get back is you may get a, I hate to say that, a prescription that actually may have an NPI number on there or a DEA number on there of the health provider that's requesting for this person to be picked up and sent somewhere. That's still is cla- that's still classed as PHI because that's associated to a health entity and a health individual with an actual medical subscriber number associated with it. Then the downside to it is you get this uh, the common theme of okay now there is actually classifications inside of healthcare from okay you have beha- behavioral health which is classified as more secure it needs to be more secure than regular. EPHI. Then you actually have anything around other types of ailments that are also more secure than that. So that gets even further down into it. So again, what happens is a lot of people become desensitized, right? So to data and really don't care about what they do with the data. And that's where we are today, both from a compliance standpoint and the potential for the you know ransomware take I know jumping back on the ransomware bandwagon, but ransomware taking advantage of it. Hey, I've got some data here. Hmm, this could be worth a lot more money than just the one Bitcoin. We can ask for a thousand Bitcoins, right? So because we yeah. just we just hit the jackpot. So and that's the downside to it is because either we've become so complacent around compliance that we either get it thrown at us in every different direction. That as individuals, you know how many times you go to a file share. Or you go somewhere and you just go and just do a per, you just do a little hey you know, I'm gonna be a little nosy just go click 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 whoa right crap so just find a file with like a bunch of freaking social secu- sorry I didn't shouldn't swear sorry uh, a bunch of uh, oh shit uh, social, sorry <laughs> uh, social security numbers um, I'm supposed to be a CEO I can't talk like that all right so um, but again a bunch of social security numbers but it's because somebody put it out there because they're sharing with somebody that's in a different department or a different uh, side of the country um, and then. You know, we're working with an entity that actually says, hey, we don't get sensitive data. We don't touch sensitive data. Well, come to find out, they used our tool and discovered that they were actually receiving hundreds of thousands of social security numbers from the state. And it was in the very last column. And the actual entity that receiving this was actually ignoring it. it was actually ignoring they, it. They, they, they were weren't fo- scrolling over enough to see them is nope. what you're saying. Literally weren't exactly. scrolling over enough to nope. see them. Exactly. They were not oh seeing them. Oh, my God. And they were getting that for years upon years upon years. So it was just accumulating, accumulating, accumulating. And they just basically said, whoa, what's going on? And this was only within, say, uh, a going back a, a two-year or three-year period. And now they went back as far as back as 2002. And they were receiving. And obviously, there's, du- there's, du- there's duplications. But overall, it was close to a million, almost a million Social Security numbers just in generalities. And it could be a lot less than that. But as, if you take the if you do dedupe, but because of the Ah, oh, we don't we don't do any sensitive data. We don't worry about it, and not paying attention. But then you get IT, and we talked about the triad before, only focusing on the availability. Keep the systems up. Keep the systems up. We got twenty four seven, twenty four seven, and now they forget the confidentiality and integrity because the old added age is, ah, oh, you know what? I can't be bothered with permissions. You know what? Everyone full access, uh, and then it just stays, and then it just compounds thereafter, or they just don't care where they put it. Um, and that's where I feel the next thing is to ask people is to say, do you think we as humans, right, forget about whether we work in organizations as humans, because there's so much going on in the world around cybersecurity that we've become desensitized and therefore we become complacent in how we act, whether we are in the information security world or whether we're not around how we should protect our data. I, I I would agree with that, but I think it's worse. Uh, I think uh, it, uh, two things. Uh, one, two perspectives, I guess. One is uh, people are uh, generally clueless and don't care, don't think twice about it. Security is just completely somebody else's prerogative. I'm just, you know as a member of an organization here to do my job. So uh, it's not even desensitized as much as it's not even on anybody's radar screen. Quote the Home Depot CEO, uh, we sell hammers, why should we care about security? Uh, this, this, the, 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 
complementary flip side, another way of looking at that is um, the way that uh, we as an industry tend to reinforce people not needing to think about it or care about it because we keep shoving all sorts of solutions down people's throats saying, just use this and you'll be good. Just use this and you'll be good. Just use right. this and be good. So you don't even have to think about security. It's just, it, it's, it's all transparent and, and, and just happens magically. So on the one end, you got people not thinking about it out of ignorance. On the other end, you've got people not thinking about it because we're sort of creating that illusion. Uh, uh, we want people to not think about it so that they'll go out and buy more point solutions and spend more money and, and well, make us all. Yeah, but, exactly. but there's but there's differing but there's a differing opinion here, right? Uh, it's mm -hmm. not just the no, there's not think about it. It's not just about the think about it, not think about it. It's also the business doesn't give a flying shit about. Mm -hmm. The compliance set, whether it's piece. Oh, did Scott go mute? Oh, okay. Scott, that was me. Voice. Oh. I must have. Come back. Say it all over again. Yeah, you uh, mute, no. buddy. Oh man, you know, it's the 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 third additive that's in there is about companies that don't care about the compliance, that yeah. don't care about what they do with your data, but they still want to make a profit on it. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, true. true. How do you true. how do you with regimes like OG, oh, I don't know. Did it again. Has he got an auto mute button? I swear. For I, I swear I'm gonna blow this I swear I'm gonna blow this thing up. Um how do you deal with those companies that uh that really don't care about your data? Right? We've yeah. seen the advent of, of GDPR and CCPA and you know, whatever other state wants to come in and say, well, we need privacy of data, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But most people don't really care. Like, we're still using Facebook. There's still a data trade-off, right? If you think that mm -hmm. there's no data trade-off with Facebook, you've got your head in the sand, right? Yep. Um, yep. We're still using Apple products, right? Apple's still doing data mining. Google is the same way, right? Yep. You look at all these big companies that are out there and what they're doing to abuse your trust of they're going to handle my data properly, and, and you know, it, it's it it raises a really big question. Well, then you it know? jumps on the it, then it, it does it jumps on the the bandwagon of okay, you know what? For me to not even think about it, I'm going to engage zero trust, right? Which basically means is okay, zero trust to me is I need to take some responsibility and have no trust about where my data is. But what people then do is they'll offshoot it and then say, hey, I'll go and buy a product that engages zero trust for me. But then at that point, we become complacent. So that means I'm, uh, my, ignorance is, my ignorance is bliss. Let anybody do whatever they want with the data. But then I'm going to go and engage with a zero trust process, where, and, and that's policy, and driven by technology, which then basically means is I'm going to have more work because then it really I have to go back to the beginning and actually understand where my data is to unfor enforce zero trust to, so I can actually make it more effective. So it's a vicious circle. So then people become back and say, you know what? I really don't care about this at this point. Data is data. If it goes anywhere, I'll, and I'm going to say the word, I may push off some liability to cyber insurance, which is what some organizations may do, but you know, some of them uh, may not and say, I will accept the risk and worry about if something comes down the pike from a fine or the state comes after me or a regulatory uh, entity comes uh, comes after me or which I've heard on many occasions to say, well, PCI is really not law. It's corporate law. So I'm really not going to worry about it because what they're going to do, they're going to find me and maybe I get shut down from my payment processing, that kind of thing. And we've heard that all many times from many different uh, people talking about from a data perspective of where their data is and you know looking at network and who has access to it so well that that makes me want to share that to some degree i mean what we're talking about is it's a safe uh, place a risk. jeff you can share it, 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 it's a it's a risk decision and you know companies that say well you know we don't want to be pci compliant we'll just take the fine as a price of doing business which i've had customers that have done that mm -hmm. uh you know on the one hand you know as a security purist you're like oh my gosh they need to care but on the other hand it's just a business decision if it's if if it's in their mind cheaper to go one route than the other who's to say that that's a, a, a that's a wrong business decision um 
a, a nuance in that though is and uh, you know since I, I want to throw this wrench in the works because it seems like we you know you did it with cyber insurance I want to do it with this one credit card and payment card numbers those cards technically that's not consumer data it's not your customer data if you ever read the small print of the agreements you get when you get one of those cards as a consumer those cards actually are owned by the banks that issued them to you and ultimately they go back to the card brand you know the visa mastercard and whatever so they're they're letting you use them as a consumer and make you know gazillions of dollars off you uh, encouraging you to carry a balance and pay interest, but they're not technically yours. Um, and, and one of the, that impacts the PCI world, and, and I bring it up seriously because not only is there this, sometimes there's this attitude that, um, uh, you know, it's just a price of doing business, we'll just pay the fine or whatever, but from a, you know, sort of a, a global impact. How, why is society not demanding more from companies that mm -hmm. get breached that are PCI companies? It all boils down to, as a consumer, at the end of the day, if I get my credit or debit cards stolen, and, and, and not just stolen, but somebody commits fraud against me, for the most part, I'm not liable as a consumer, mm -hmm. it's it's a little bit trickier, you know, when it's a debit card and and they they've actually stolen funds out of your account. It takes longer to get the money back, but generally speaking, most of the time you get your money back. But the the limitation of liability on a credit card is, you know, if you if you find that your card's stolen, report it, and you know, we'll, you know, the banks or the card brands they they eat all the all, all the fraud costs. So that's it's a it's a variation, but it's a it's a it's a a significant variation within the PC world uh, and the lack of getting more and more companies to buy into the whole concept mm -hmm. because because there isn't this huge uh, push from public pressure uh, because f for the, for the most part the public isn't impacted. Yeah, and I think that's and I think a lot of that comes whether they're impacted in their personal life and then they bring that same kind of kind of like mentality into business life right from a business perspective so let's say mm -hmm. you're a sales entity and you're working in a call center and your ter your virtual terminal goes down that you're accepting credit cards to type in and i and i've worked with many organizations over the years that they will still tell their that that person, accept the credit card, write it down on a piece of paper, let them know that this will be charged as soon as our system comes up. And when you mm -hmm. go around and you're doing the clean desk review and, and, and an assessment from a data perspective, people perceive, oh, I, I entered it into the system. But then all of a sudden you got all these sticky notes flying everywhere that actually has full on information on credit cards that are laying around that they either mm -hmm. write over the back of it, write, scratch it out, the whole nine yards. So, you know, yeah. people make the mistake of thinking that, okay, I've done it from an electronic standpoint, but we look at data, we also need to look at the paper aspect of it. So you look at healthcare, mm -hmm. if there's a downtime, say all their EMR applications go down, what happens? They go back to medical records back for like it was 20 years ago, and they're engaging and enforcing that. But then what's the process of taking that information when the systems are back online again and ensuring that sensitive data whether they believe it's sensitive or not, is entered into the system as accurate as possible, scanned in. And then what are they doing with that data afterwards? Because that's when you go down and do a tabletop. A lot of them don't think of it. They think, oh, we're just putting it in straight into the secure little wheelie bin that's got a padlock on it and a little slit at the top and putting it right in there. But how do you know it actually is going there? Because they don't because they're in the middle of an actual disaster and they don't know what's going on. So people don't mm -hmm. look at data at a physical level. They only, a lot of times they focus at an electronic level um, and, you know, a lot of times if people complain to me and you know, I'll use I'll use PCI as a reference again. Well, I've got credit card information in a filing cabinet, but that's not covered by PCI. So I don't need to worry about it. I'm like, well, you're still storing sensitive data. You need to look at it from a PCI standpoint, because one way or another, how are you processing that card? You're taking that piece of paper out on a monthly basis if it's a reoccurring charge and entering it in. You need to do it. So then it's the perception of people. And I don't know if it's due to education or if it's due to the fact that people are, you know, you know, lazy. I don't know. When it comes to data, they just seem to see that anytime that they see a free opportunity of space on a server, they'll just dump whatever they think is to put it out there 
And then then they will have plausible deniability. I didn't know. I didn't know. Well, I didn't know. I didn't know. It's yeah, not my but fault. Liam, 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 info, infosec prediction time, right? <laughs> dictates that <laughs> the Grand Puba has entered. Continue. <laughs> people are going to continue to not care about what happens with the privacy of their data, much like they don't care about a company being breached. Yeah. Right. Wait, wait. I, need, so, I think we need to back up a step. Number one. There was a question in Discord. Is the filing cabinet part of PCI? Yeah, Jeff? I was going to jump in. Uh, let me respond to that, and then we need to take a quick break. Uh, I, I wanted to correct you, Liam, because uh, one of the misconceptions about PCI, especially in the early years, was that PCI only cared about uh, an actual transaction and, and sort of the, the, the transaction processing mm -hmm. flow. Not true. Uh, er, early on, and, and this has been reinforced, uh, uh, it, it's any any use of credit card data within an organization for any use whatsoever, including uh, hard copy paper storage. So, you know, uh, customer loyalty programs where they're keeping uh, payment data and, you know, storing it so you can, you know, renew yeah. once a month and all that kind of stuff. Often that's online, but, you know, I used to go to one of my early customers was a, a newspaper, you know, media uh, organization where they had salespeople that would call people up and they, they actually literally had uh, Rolodexes with, uh, you know, index cards of all their loyal customers with the, the credit card information mm -hmm. written out. Yep. Um, uh, those uh, younger listening audience can uh, Google Rolodex to see what we're talking about. So, yeah. Oh, God. Uh, you know, Oh God! Paper, seriously, paper, paper, uh, paper counts. So any any place where it's transmitted, mm -hmm. processed, or stored electronically or physically is part of PCI. Uh, so yes, thank you uh, for calling that out, uh, Dimitri. Good catch. Let's take a quick break. Uh, we're all chomping at the bit to keep going, but let's take a quick pause. We'll come back in a minute. <laughs> 